Well, good morning, everyone. Well, it's a privilege to be here, and uh, so what I'm going to do is give you a little introduction to my piece in the Fritz Schrift. It's called uh, Liturgicals, Pietists, and the Kingdom of the Left, and it's, 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 uh, it's, pr it's probably a little bit different than most of the other articles, which tend to be um, you know, more theological. This is kind of a, a little a broader topic, I guess, but I wanted to just give you a, a, little, uh, a little introduction to, uh, to what, it's, what it's about. One thing, if you kind of notice, if you talk to liturgically minded Lutherans, Missouri Synod Lutherans, we tend to be pretty much uh, homogeneous in terms of our worldview, in terms of our social view, po political view. I mean, I don't think we're in lockstep uh, with each other, but there's a consistency, there's a tendency towards conservatism in our ranks. And, uh, and uh, this is kind of a historical thing uh, as, as well. But, uh, but we do tend towards conservatism. Uh, call, calling to mind um, uh, Charles Porterfield Krauth's magnificent book, The Conservative Reformation. He kind of gets into that. It was written in 1871 and gets into the sort of conservative mind of our brand of the Reformation. The Lutheran Reformation is inherently conservative. And our conservatism doesn't, it's not compartmentalized. It's not like we have this religious conservatism and, uh, and we don't have that worldview elsewhere. We don't compartmentalize it. It's not like, uh, what is it, the PIF form where you say whether you're liturgical or not and there's a little sliding scale or something um, and then that, that, that's your religion thing and then how else you think about society and the world is a completely different thing. Am I supposed to do that PIF form? Um, I, don't, I think I did one in 2005. I think they might want another one, I'm not sure. But again, this is a tendency, it's not a rule, but there is real, a real tendency of a consistent uh, social and political conservatism among uh, what we would call the Godestines crowd. Uh, some people might say, well, what about the high church libs, right? Because it was back in the 60s and 70s, uh, maybe earlier than that, there was a sort of a high church movement, a liturgical movement, and, uh, and, and it was very liberal. It was very left-wing in terms of uh, politics and society. That's why, uh, I guess, when I first became a pastor in 2004, uh, some of the older guys would freak out if they saw a collar or a chasuble uh, because they associated that with Seminex and such. Um, and, you know, and also the, you have the, the sort of high church Episcopalians or the ELCA, and they really don't uh, fit this pattern. Uh, I forget who it was yesterday said that their philosophy is they like liturgy because it's pretty. Um, and, that, and that certainly is not us. I mean, sometimes we get stereotyped that way, but no, it, we, we are liturgical because it's in the service of the gospel, the service of the word of God, and we hold on to that. And that's really what conservatism is. It's a holding on to rather than changing for change's sake, which is really more of a progressivism. And those are the, those are, that's kind of the battle lines between conservatives and progressives. And, in, and, uh, and, but I would say that, that that tendency among high church liberalism is really a recent thing, and it's kind of a flash in the pan, especially among Missouri Synod Lutherans. I guess there's still a few of them around. I mean, most of them are long gone to the glue factory or whatever. Um, they're not really relevant. Uh, ALPB, we were talking about this just a, uh, a few days ago. They were taking some shots at Godestines in their little echo chamber. Uh, a bunch of has-been, left-wing, nobodies were, uh, you know, they, they referred to us as the saber of boldness. Like, they didn't even get our name right. They called us the saber of boldness, and their, their categorization of us is that we're, we're, we're not really evangelical Catholics like they are, they, those lefties. Uh, we're, we're just a political group in the Missouri Synod. We're all about the United List. How, how, how could, is it possible they could have mischaracterized us even worse? I mean, how, how is it even possible? They think, that's what they think of us. I know many of you in this room, and uh, at best, uh, the conventions and politics are a necessary evil. Most of us find it distasteful. We'd rather be hearing about the Psalms. We'd rather be hearing about Jesus. Um, but, the, but that's the way the left mind is. It's very political oriented. They think, and to, you know, they're thinking about bylaws and, instead of the Psalter, and they sort of project that onto us. Uh, but again, I think they're a flash in the pan. I think they're has-beens. I think left-wing 
liturgicalism is, is all but dead. It's moribund, and nobody cares about what they think. So uh, at any rate, um, the, I think the difference is those of us who are liturgical uh, among our circles, we're grounded and moored by the Word of God, right? The, the Word and our confessions. And that is why we're liturgical. So it's a completely different thing uh, than this flash-in-the-pan 20th century uh, liberal uh, liturgicalism. Um, so my, my, uh, my book is, or my, uh, my uh, essay is taking a look primarily at a book called The Progressive Era, written by a scholar named Murray N. Rothbard. It was published just a few years ago posthumously, uh, published by the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Uh, by the way, uh, Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S.org, is, is a really a place to go uh, to check out. It is a, it's, it's primarily um, uh, about free market economics, but it is a, a very conservative, and most of the people at the Mises Institute are conservative Christians. And they, they literally have hundreds of books for free download. And the Progressive Era is one of them. So you can download it and read it. Um, it's, it's a very important work in looking at a period in American history that's formative to where we are now, but it's almost never taught in school, even at the university level. So this is a remarkable piece of work by Murray Rothbard, The Progressive Era. Um, Rothbard was an interesting person. Um, he was an, an agnostic Jew, but he, he knows, he gets us. He knows, he understands liturgical Lutheranism. Of course, he's a polymath. He, he understood a lot of things. But he was an agnostic Jew who was married to a Presbyterian woman who remained uh, true to her faith her whole life long. But uh, Rothbard was a colleague of Ayn Rand and studied in her circles. But he got excommunicated from her circles because he, he, uh, she ordered him to uh, divorce his Presbyterian wife because she was one of those Christians. And uh, so he, he mocked her, he made fun of her, and actually wrote a play, you can find it, uh, it's called uh, Mozart Was a Red, and he's mocking Ayn Rand's kind of obsession over this nonsense. Uh, Rothbard was also one of the founders of the Cato Institute, and also one of the founders of the Libertarian Party, but he actually distanced himself from both of those organizations, because uh, Cato kind of became sort of beltway sycophantic, uh, you know, in their, in their conservatism and their libertarianism. And the LP, the Libertarian Party, just became crazy, uh, just became libertines more than anything else. But, he's, uh, but uh, again, uh, uh, Rothbard is a remarkable scholar, very prolific, and the progressive era is, I think it's, it, it's, it's a new work in terms of publication, but I think it's going to be very important over the coming years in terms of scholarship. So... Um, Rothbard, part of his book, he analyzes American politics and social views in light of various confessions of Christianity. Uh, the progressive era is basically <clears throat> 1890s to 1920s. So it's a really critical time of change in American uh, political and social history. It's a pivotal time. And uh, the, at this time, both of the political parties, Republicans and Democrats, moved in a progressive direction. And uh, just to give you a feel for what I'm talking about, uh, between the 1890s, 1920s, uh, think about the Federal Reserve Act, 1913, where we got fiat currency. Uh, think about the direct election of senators, which is a lurch towards democracy from Republican, uh, uh, Republican model. Uh, prohibition, which is authoritarian statism. Think about the New Deal, which was kind of on the heels of the progressive era, where we we were introduced to, in our, in our American life, of socialism and fascism. And uh, so what about Christianity? Where were Christians on all of this? Well, they were split. And the split is what's really interesting. Um, it's really, it boils down to liturgicals versus pietists. I mean, isn't that amazing? And again, it's because our worldview extends beyond the chancel. Um, on the one side were the liturgicals. They were the Roman Catholics and the high church Lutherans, the liturgical Lutherans. That was one political block that was very influential. On the other side, you had the evangelicals, uh, the neo-evangelical Protestants, and along with them were the pietistic Lutherans. So the Lutherans were divided down the middle based on how they worshiped. I mean, this is really incredible stuff, and, and Rothbard really cuts to the heart of this, and it's just amazing because, you know, he's the farthest thing from a Missouri Synod Lutheran 
uh, that you can get. But like I said, he gets us. He understands our worldview and, and how the influence we've had on American life. Um, so the liturgical Lutherans consistently took conservative views on all of these things. And, it's, and this is really based on a lot of data that was crunched by a, a series of scholars, a bunch of scholars, including this guy, Paul Kleppner, who I also quote in my essay. I mean, he did this painstaking work of analyzing voting patterns precinct by precinct, because in the progressive era, in, that, in, the, in the 1800s and early 1900s, um, we were still very um, uh, neighborhood oriented. So one precinct may have been you know, German Lutherans who were in the um, uh, Missouri Synod. Another precinct may have been German Scandinavians who were more pietistic. Another pre precinct may have been um, uh, Wisconsin Synod. And there are clear patterns and correlations in their voting patterns. It's really fascinating. So, um, so what about these uh, liturgical Lutherans? It, it even goes back beyond, further back in time than just the progressive era. And Rothbard gets into that in, in building up to explaining the progressive era. Uh, so for instance, uh, even in the uh, mid, the, well our, our forebears came over in the mid 1800s, right? And even back in those days, they were very conservative politically and socially. They were uh, against the national bank. They were for hard currency, for gold as a hard currency rather than inflationary currency. They were for traditional values, of course, as far as the family roles and uh, the roles of men and women. Um, it goes without saying they were against prohibition. Um, and uh, that was a time when the Methodists were really dominant in our country, mid-1800s. I mean, nowadays they're pretty much, Methodists are pretty much to the fringes, but they were pushing the temperance movement. And, and also closely with that was the suffrage movement for women. It was very left-wing and, and they were pushing uh, prohibition. Um, Dr. Rast tells the story, I wish I could remember the particulars, you, some of you might have heard this story, where it was, in, uh, it was in the 19th century, I think it was in, in uh, Illinois, there was a, uh, a congregation of Lutherans and they would have, after church on Sunday, they would go out and have beers in the churchyard. Well, the neighboring Methodists were terribly scandalized by this. So they passed a, a law in the city. They made it a dry city. So the, what the Lutherans did, they bought a little piece of property just across the city line and after divine service, they had a parade every Sunday. They put the keg on a cart and they had music and, and, and they, they actually paraded past all the scowling Methodists in the city and went to the city line, set up and, and had, the, had, a, had a kegger, you know. Um, so it, it, this was part and parcel of liturgical Lutheranism. They, they really did not want government telling you that you can't drink alcohol, among other things. They were also uh, very anti-socialist and anti-communist. Um, Walther even wrote on this topic, and you might think, why, you know, in, in why that early on? Well, um, just to give you a little background, the uh, uh, Communist Manifesto came out in 1848, and there were revolutions in Europe and attempted revolutions. Most of them were uh, were, were failures, and a lot of these uh, German communist revolutionaries after their revolution failed, you don't stick around after your revolution fails, right? Guess where they came? They came to the United States. And guess what party they joined? They joined the Liberal Party, which was the Republican Party, yeah. So uh, at any rate, uh, this, this was kind of, the, uh, the Missouri Synod Lutherans were in the, in the maelstrom of all of this when they first came over. Um, now the Pietists, of course, uh, had a, an opposite view. Again, this kind of confirms uh, lex orandi, lex credendi. You know, your worldview that shapes your liturgical, your worship, does shape other things in your life as well. So uh, Kleppner, Paul Kleppner, uh, whom Rothbard cites, under, you know, really understands this, and I'll just read you a, a cite from, uh, from what I cited from Kleppner. He wrote, religion involves more than an associational dimension. It is more than an organized body of doctrine relating to the supernatural. It is a perspective, a frame of reference for the organization of experiences. It is a particular kind of perspective, one that informs men broadly about the nature of reality 
and that penetrates all the more fragmentary worlds in which they participate, to understand the world as human actors perceive it, to understand the world to which they react, we must analyze these orientations. And so that's why he started looking at religion in terms of writing political history um, in the United States. One thing that comes up a lot among the pietists is they're millenarians. They really have this sense of perfectibility of man on, on earth, you know, in our lifetime. The Methodists are very much like this. And uh, by contrast, we liturgicals believe in original sin. So the pietists are emphasizing sanctification, even in their political life. They're going to clean up America. They're going to make America, you know, po you know uh, pious, right, and, uh, and, and holy. Uh, whereas the liturgicals emphasize justification, okay? So there's a great deal of moralism in the other side, and, and in fact, that's the social gospel movement, which you know, really, I argue, is the same as what we have today in the social justice movement. It's really the same kind of thing. It's just taken on some different flavors. So there's a sense of eschatology here, even, which is not something you really think a lot about in terms of American history, but eschatology is really important. Um, uh, let's see, I had a, another little quote I want to read to you. Uh, this is from me speaking, but I'm quoting uh, Dr. Kleppner again uh, in part of this. I said, uh, politically speaking, the ritualist, which is another term that Kleppner uses for the liturgical, the ritualist is not interested in changing the world. By contrast, the pietist wishes to purge the world of sin the latter translates to social activism, the use of politics in the state as moral agents of conversion, hence the temperance movement and blue laws as political manifestations of the pietist worldview. Um, so uh, so uh, again, Rothbard picks up on this, and, and um, in this, this is a delight, this is Rothbard, this is pure Rothbard, he's a delightful writer, and he's, he, he argues it this way. The liturgical correctly perceived the pietist as the persistent, hectoring busybody and aggressor, hell-bent to deprive him of his Sunday beer and his voluntarily supported parochial schools, so necessary to preserve and transmit his religion and his values. While the pietist was a pestiferous crusader, the liturgical wanted nothing so much as to be left alone. It is no wonder that the Republican Party, the party of the pietists, the party that catered to prohibitionists, blue law agitators, and compulsory public school advocates, was known throughout this period as the party of great moral ideas, while the Democrats, the party of the liturgicals, the party deeply opposed to compulsory morality, were known as the party of personal liberty. So anyway, and of course, the. Uh, the parties do go back and forth over time. It's not just that they switched at some point. Um, at the time of the mid-19th century, that was the third party system. We're on the, the sixth party system right now, so I allude to that in my article as well. So again, in the mid-1800s, the Republicans were the leftists. They even had a, a radical wing uh, of Marxists. The Democrats were the conservatives, and so the liturgicals found their home there. Uh, prior to the uh, the uh, to the um, pro, um, to the uh, um, progressive era itself. During the progressive era, there was there was some mixture there. Uh, but prior to that, they, the liturgicals were firmly in the Democratic Party. Um, another quote I want to just leave you, uh, read you here. Another thing too that came about during the progressive era was eugenics and birth control, and of course. The Roman Catholics and the liturgical Lutherans were firmly on the side uh, against those things, whereas the Pietists were in favor of eugenics. Why? They're trying to make heaven on earth. So we're going to breed, uh, breed ourselves into the millennium, you know? So a um, uh, quote here from, uh, from Rothbard. But the problem was that the fecund women were not the Pietist progressives, but the Catholics. In other words, the, the, it was our side that was producing more people, you know. For in addition to immigration, another source of democratic alarm to the pietists was the far higher birth rate among Catholic women. 
If only they could be induced to adopt birth control. Hence, the birth control movement became part of the pietist armamentarium in their systemic struggle with the Catholics and other liturgicals. So remember, at that time, the Missouri Synod was uh, aligned with Roman Catholics and others who were opposed to birth control. But birth control was a sort of a left-wing, progressive idea to come and to, and to control. You know, it's, it's eugenics is what it is. We're going to prevent the, uh, uh, the bad people from breeding, and we're going to have the good people uh, to breed. It's, it's an insidious, evil um, Thing. But, uh, but again, once again, it's, you see this split among pietists and uh, liturgicals. Um, Rothbard referred to it as Yankee post-millennial pietism, and he abbreviates it as YPP. Again, he's, uh, he's an amusing uh, writer to read. Um, also, this calls to mind, uh, if you go back in time a little bit, remember uh, Finney and the Great Awakening, and Rothbard gets into this as well. The Great Awakening was 1820s, I think, 1830s. Um, again, it's a pietistic movement, it's an anti-liturgical movement, and it's, it, it, these were called the New Measures. It's actually mentioned in Synod's first constitution, which I quote in my article here. Synod's first constitution denounced it. I mean, it was contemporary worship is what it was. It was contemporary worship, it was emotion-based, it was anti-liturgical, anti-sacramental, and the liturgical Lutherans were firmly against that. And it really is this kind of millenarian sense of creating, that's what the, you know, Finney and them were all about. They wanted to create heaven on earth. And uh, the liturgicals understood uh, through word and sacrament, through our confessions, through the Bible, we understood original sin, we understand what the mission of the church is. And uh, so anyway, um, uh, and uh, so this, th anyway, my article just kind of uh, sums up basically Rothbard's argument about, what, uh, about this worldview that we liturgical Lutherans have. And I think it's still valid today, and I think we're still fighting a lot of these same battles today, especially with this woke movement, social uh, justice movement. It's really just this thing regurgitated back at us once again. So anyway, I've almost, I almost got a half hour done, Dave. So uh, I guess I, any time for questions? Couple questions. If anyone has anything, um, yes, please. Well, what would you say to a pietist who says, "I'm merely using the law, perhaps the first use of the, use of the law in a social setting, to bring about you know God's law in a, in a political and a legislative way, or, uh, leg legislating morality, right?" So at the end of the day, any law is going to have a judgment of some kind. So what would you say to that I'm just as a Christian imposing the Christian worldview as I should, since I have the opportunity to vote in a democracy or in a republic, I have the opportunity to vote, I'm going to vote for Christian morality. Yeah, it's, you know, the, again, this world, the whole worldview, though, is a lot more complicated than that, because, like, for instance, the, when, when you think about something like an economic issue, like hard currency versus fiat currency, well, what's the Christian view on that? Well, I mean, fiat currency is theft. It's theft by the state. But if your, mind, if your mindset is, yes, but we can steal and help poor people, we can use the government to steal and to swindle and engage in fraud to help poor people. If your worldview is so centered on, let's help the poor, but it's not really helping the poor, it's really hurting everybody. Um, I, I, think that, I think the liturgical element, uh, the liturgicals have a more grounded view, I think, in, in scripture, in original sin, in understanding reality. And, uh, and, and so it's, I, I don't know that I'm answering your question or not, but, uh, but you know, a lot of, I, I remember a lot of times you have pietistic or, or non-liturgical Lutherans, they'll tell you, oh no, I'm a conservative, I believe God created the world in, in six days. And they, and they try to wear that conservative banner. But what, it's not so much liberal versus conservative. I think the real issue is more conservative versus progressive. If your worldview allows for an evolution of the world becoming better through education or through government or through uh, whatever means that we can make the world a better place through force of some kind, because ultimately that's what it is, that's what progressivism is. So I think, I, I think if we sort of frame it instead of liberal versus conservative, um, I think, I think uh, you'll find more friendliness towards progressivism among pietists. But there are conservative progressives as well. There's a conservative version of progressivism uh, that, that's there too that we have to be careful of as well. Yes, sir. 
Well, Larry, thank you for a wonderfully insightful uh, delivery. My question is about what comes next, for example, in the Missouri Senate. Looking from the top down, where are the confessional <coughs> congressmen, senators, judges, uh, where are we in our state uh, legislatures? Where are we in our communities? And how do we raise up youth who can begin to think deeply about these matters? Where are our Concordias? What, what's the first step, the way ahead to, to help people think in these terms? Because it has implications of not just voting, but serving. Where do we go from here? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think that I think that we have to understand what progressivism really is. It's and it's an it's an attack upon our past. It, the idea is that the past is bad and we're we're better. You know, we're we're good people and our our future is always going to be better than our um, uh, than our past as long as we change stuff. And that that penchant for change comes out in in it with liturgy too, like. Uh, don't, what is it, Fritz? Don't break it. Don't, don't, don't do that or you'll break it. How, what's the title of the book? Leave it alone, you'll break it. I, no, I really think we need to foster, that's really what conservatism really is. And if, it's, if we're liturgically conservative, it reflects a worldview that I think we need to understand is broader than that. Like Fritz said, he hopes the statue of Wordsworth will still be standing. Why are statues being torn down? It's a progressive worldview. It's those were bad old guys, and we have to replace them with, with we who live now who are superior. It, it, it's also a matter of the fourth commandment, isn't it? Honor your father and your mother. What does that mean in Hebrew? It doesn't just mean mom and dad. I mean, it's your ancestors. It's your forebears. It's your history. So I really think we have to orient towards that. It doesn't mean being uncritical of our ancestors, but we need to be respectful. We need to honor them. And, and, and again, you know, uh, conservatism isn't just you know, checking, this, checking the Republican box when you go to vote. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a worldview that opposes progressivism. It's a worldview that says we retain the truth. The truth doesn't change. We need to confess the truth, and, and that isn't just, it isn't just in the chancel, it's not just in Bible class, it is uh, in the holistic person, in our society, in our culture, everything. We have, we, you know, some things need to change, and we should change them. We Lutherans understand that. You know, we, uh, Dr. Luther translated the Mass into German because it needed to be done, but he didn't throw it all out like the Anabaptists did. And I think the pietistic worldview is one that is too amenable to change and it's too heavily influenced by, progress, by a progressive worldview, an evolutionary worldview. That's what, so I think we need to get back to our you know, fundamental roots about what is, we need to study history, we need to understand that uh, change for change's sake is not what we're doing here. It's, that's not what Reformation is. Maybe we need to have everybody read The Conservative Reformation by Charles Porterfield Krauth because that really does set the tone of what does it mean to be Lutheran, to be authentically Lutheran. And that, and that, that spills over into, into our worship life as well. So maybe we're coming at this from, a back, from, a, from the other way as sort of the Goddesses crowd. We know intuitively that the liturgy is the right thing to do and that monkeying with it will probably mess it up. I mean, that's kind of the conservative mindset. Leave it alone or you'll break it. I mean, I, I can't get any better than that. So I don't know if, John, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, well, my question is how, how you seed that. And you said, yeah, you seed it by catechesis. You seed it liturgically. And I'm thinking, yeah, let's seed it in the Concordias so that when yeah. they have history and government, they're exposed to actual critical thinking regarding yeah, this. So absolutely. how we seed it is what I'm interested in. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thanks, Larry. Thank you.